tonight, we're just going to ever so briefly talk about what has happened before and what has happened after the Baroque period. We've got all these time periods and music is a part of what happens in this. The Renaissance, as you can see, was the period immediately before the Baroque period, okay? Renaissance really means, literally it means rebirth, okay? What happened in this time was that they were starting to play with different modes, not major and minor scales, but they would all have a different character. Um, and that was what we would see in the music, a lot of choral music. Maybe you've heard of the composer Monteverdi or Palestrina. That was the time period right before the Baroque. We had a few instruments that'd be used, organs would be used, um, early keyboard instruments and string instruments. Remember, this is the time that the instruments are starting to be developed. The Baroque period, 1600 to 1750, about 400 years ago. We're gonna come back to that when we kind of focus on that. The classical period, I'm sure you all know the names of the classical period composers, Mozart and Haydn, Beethoven, and even the sons of Bach. How many of you know how many sons Bach had that became composers? Hmm, let's see. Anybody know how many? Just let's put that down, number one on your paper. How many sons did Bach have that became composers? Following the classical period, which is the time of Mozart, Beethoven, we have the romantic period. And romantic doesn't necessarily mean music all about love. It can be about lots of emotions, strong emotions. And the composers of that time period were Schubert and Mendelssohn and Tchaikovsky and Brahms, just to name a few. And then we get into the modern period. Um, you'll notice that there's some overlap. You know, there, we didn't get to a certain year and say, oh, we're all done with Baroque music. Oh, we're all done with classical music. It kind of, there was a lot of overlap into when some things started and when some things ended or were just developed, okay? If you've heard of the name Aaron Copland, he would be considered a modern composer or Stravinsky. And right now we would be in what would be called the postmodern period. Paul, you can take that down. Could you please, thank you so much. Could you please give a thumbs up if you have heard of two of those musical time periods? Just a thumbs up in the reaction if you've heard of two of those time periods. Excellent, excellent. All right, I'm gonna give you the answer to your question. There were four sons of Bach that were composers. And his sons wrote music because he thought, they thought their dad was so old fashioned. Okay, you don't have to answer this. Do any of you ever think your parents are a little old fashioned? I hope you're all shaking your head no. Well, the Bach boys, they thought their dad, they, they thought Johann Sebastian was a little old fashioned. So they wrote some fancier music, music that had all sorts of twists and turns. So you're gonna see through our little are talking today that we're going to have um, some music evolving from all different starting points. So there were no clear lines, no clear lines in music. Things evolve. They take shape. They move forward a little bit. Maybe they move back a little bit. Music is still evolving today. Raise your hand if you believe that. Music is still evolving today. And you know what? We can even trace that back to our beginning history on our instruments. Some of the things that are written today are inspired by music of Bach, maybe even of Monteverdi. All right, the lecture or the class today, let's not call it a lecture. The class today was introduction to Baroque music. Okay, raise your hand if you remember what year, what time period Baroque music is, about how many years, how many hundreds of years ago? 400 years ago, 1600, almost as old as me. How about that? Some of the other things that were happening in the Baroque period, let's talk about the architecture. 
churches were big. They were filled with light. And one of the big things, they were full of ornaments, decorations. You'd go into these big, big churches and they would be filled with all sorts of decorations that they had never seen before. Um, science, a lot was happening in science. Raise your hand if you've heard of Newton, Galileo, Kepler. All those scientists were of the Baroque period. Absolutely. Um, we are going to talk for just a minute about some of the characteristics, what you might hear in music of the Baroque. Okay, and then we're going to get into specific composers. Um, could you, in your reactions, show me an applause if you either enjoy playing Baroque music or listening to Baroque music? Great. We're going to do a lot of listening as we move on here. All right. Some of the things we're going to be talking about and listening to is what was going on in the music. First of all, before Baroque music was written, instrumental music was used for two things, usually to accompany singers and dancers. It wasn't just written for itself. You wouldn't just write a, a piece just for violin. I know, as disappointing as that might be. You would write to accompany a singer and a dancer. And that started to change. That started to change when the instruments started to develop. So what we're going to start seeing are the instruments develop, the violins. What country was the hub? Anybody know what country the hub of string development was? I'll give you a, I'll give you a clue. I'll give you a couple choices. Uh, either Australia or Italy. Raise your hand if you think Australia was the hub of string development. Raise your hand if you think it was Italy. It was Italy. Lots going on. Lots going on in Italy. So what was happening, music was no longer just for dances or for accompanying singers. It was to showcase the instruments. There would be, there would be pieces written just for that instrument. We're going to hear a piece that was written just for cello. There are some Bach violin suites, and I know I'm gearing this a little bit towards strings. If you play a clarinet, it wasn't, oh, good, Annalise, thank you for raising your hand. It really wasn't until Mozart championed the clarinet to be included. We're going to see a little bit of that. Again, there's overlap between the lines. But in the Baroque period, we're going to see lots of ornamentation, just like in the buildings, lots of ornamentation. We're going to see and hear contrasting moods. Major and minor chords and sections are going to be used a lot. Ornamentation, the decoration, the instrumentation, we're going to start to see chamber orchestras formed, small orchestras formed. So, what was happening in architecture and in the writing, we're seeing in the music more ornate, more instruments being used, and the development of the orchestra. All right, here's your countries. You need to remember four countries. Okay, mouth, what country this string instrument, where was the hub of activity for string instruments? What country was that? Or what region we should call it? Italy. Okay, that's one of our countries, one of our composers. France was another one, Germany, and England. Those are the four regions we're just going to briefly touch on today. All right, Italy. Listen to all these composers' names. Monteverdi, Corelli, Scarlatti, Gemignani, Frescobaldi, Locatelli. And there was, how many of you have heard of a female composer in the Italian, in the Baroque period. Strozzi, Barbara Strozzi. Oh my goodness, yes. So those are all Italian composers. Give me an applause and the reaction if you've heard of any of those Italian composers. Monteverdi, Corelli, Scarlatti, Locatelli, Vivaldi. Okay. All right. France. There's two 
One was a very, very famous composer, and he, he was so known for his keyboard, Jean-Philippe Rameau. Any, any keyboard players in here? Anybody, any pianists? Okay, Rameau, you will probably be studying the music of Rameau. Absolutely. And there's another composer, which I'm gonna just tell you the side story because it's, I think it's really interesting. Jean-Baptiste Lully. Has anybody ever heard of Lully? He was the court musician for Louis XIV, and he was not a nice man at all. He was actually very mean and deceitful, deceptive. And what he did, he didn't want anybody else to compose music in, in, in Paris. So he had the copyright, which meant nobody else could publish music. It's really awful, really a selfish thing. Does anybody know? Okay, here's your one morbid fact for the day, how Luli died. Annalise, is it Annalise or Annalisa? Annalise, could you unmute yourself? Could you share that with us, please? So Luli died by gangrene. Since he conducted by pounding a stick on the floor, he ended up getting his foot. Excellent. Thank you so much. Back then, for the ballets, they wouldn't conduct with their hands. They had a big rod, a staff, and they would bang the beats on the floor. And he accidentally banged his foot. And it got infected. And over a period of time, it got gangrene and he died. So do you know what the moral of that story is? Don't be a mean conductor. Okay, that's the moral of that story. All right. So Germany, who's a big composer, the Baroque composer from Germany? JSB, who thinks they can decipher that? Quinn. Who is JSB? Um, Bach. Johann Sebastian Bach. But there's also another composer that we don't, we forget about. And that is Georg Philipp Telemann. And Telemann, according to Steve Sterick on NPR, had the most musical output of any composer. He wrote lots and lots of things um, and I hope you are able to discover some of his music as well. England, Handel, raise your hand if you've heard of George Frederick Handel. How about William uh, Boyd, Boyce or Purcell, Henry Purcell, okay? So I have a feeling you've probably heard of Vivaldi, maybe Lully, but Bach, and then probably Handel. Those are the composers that we are going to focus on today. All right, who knows the nickname of Vivaldi? What was Vivaldi's nickname? Annalise, you are our musical scholar today. Vivaldi was known as the Red Priest. The Red-Haired Priest, absolutely. He trained to be a musician as well as a priest. And the story goes that he was uh, helping with the mass and he was so consumed with a melody going through his head that he left his position in the middle of the mass to go write it down and he was no longer asked to be in the church services. So he became a full-time composer. He was too consumed with his melodies. So he was a conductor, a composer, and he also taught at a girls' school in Venice, La Pieta. And there was another composer in England who also had the opportunity to teach at a girls school. Anybody know about, uh, ooh, about a hundred years ago, the compo, oh my goodness, our scholar. Yes, please tell us, Annalise. Holst. Yes, Gustav Holst also had this ideal situation of having to write music all the time. So if you've ever played the St. Paul Suite, that was exactly the school where um, Holst was at. So let's go back to the Baroque period. In the Baroque period, we're talking about Vivaldi. They always had to have new music all the time. Lots of music for new occasions every week. We're gonna see this with Bach as well. Bach had to write church music 
every Sunday, cantatas. Can you imagine having to write music every Sunday? The choir would, he would have to prepare the choir and the singers every week, it would be new music. He also was a great keyboard player, an organist. Probably the one thing everybody knows is how many children did Bach have? Now he had two wives, let's remember he had two wives. 21, 21, yes. All right, let's go to our third country. And that is, or our third composer, Jean-Philippe Rameau. He actually replaced Lully, his position after he died. He was a composer as well as somebody who wrote the theory of music. He wanted people to really understand how things were written. Um, but lots for harpsichord and lots for the stage and opera. All right, raise your hand or give me an applause in the reaction if you are familiar with the music of Handel. What's his most famous work? What do you think? What do you think if you were to call out a piece by Handel? It's done every December. Number one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Messiah, right? All right. Um, here's a fun fact. Anybody a big fan of uh, rock and roll of the 60s, particularly Jimi Hendrix? Okay. Jimi Hendrix and George Frederick Handel lived in the house next to each other 300 years apart in London. There you go. There's your fun fact about Handel. All right. So let's talk about the instruments. Raise your hand if you think in Baroque music there were tubas played. How about in the reactions? Give me a thumbs up if tubas were played. How about castanets? Paul, could you put up, I think I, if you could put up the instruments sheet. What we have is the heart of the orchestra to start with is the harpsichord. And then we have strings. We have a few winds. The winds would be maybe flute, maybe oboe. Maybe it would be only one of them at a time. Or in pairs, you might have just the flutes playing or just the oboes playing. We might also have bassoon added later on. And the brass would probably be just the horns or the trumpets or both. And percussion would really only be timpani. All right, Paul, you can take that one down. Thank you so much. Give me a reaction, a thumbs up if we would have saxophone in the Baroque period. Absolutely not. Right. That wasn't developed till much later in Paris. I think it was Paris, in France anyways. All right, let's go up to that next sheet, Paul, about the instruments. We have got, this is what's called a family of vials, a concert of vials. These would have been played in the Renaissance period, okay? This concert of vials. But as the violin was being developed, oh, the mid 1500s, early 1600s, the violin and the violin family kind of took over. You'll notice this if you're a string player, that these vials have much more slopey curves to them. Uh, they had six strings, if you'll notice that. The strings uh, that are played today only have four strings. So these vials kind of disappeared. Um, again, you're gonna see in some of the recordings that we watch, there is overlap. You're going to see some of these being played in combination with our modern string instruments. So vials, they were not the predecessors of the violin or the string family. These vials, they were at the start of the Renaissance. But as the violin became more popular, they kind of went out of fashion a little bit, okay? So, Paul, I think we can go to our next sheet. 
tuning. Oh, I'm sure that when you go to your lesson, your, your teacher always says, let's get that instrument in tune let's tune well you know something back in the baroque period depending on what part of the country you were in your instrument could be tuned totally different you might have an a that sounds like a g you might have an a that sounds like a g sharp so depending can you imagine going to edina for a rehearsal and they're saying well that tuning is different it needs to be tuned differently that is what would have happened in the Baroque period. All right. We're going to, Paul, I think we're going to start the music. We'll save that last one for kind of summing it up. We're going to listen to um, some different recordings. And for this first recording, I want you to write down, what do you see? Four things. So just put, I guess this is number two. Write down four things that you see. We are going to listen to a piece that I think you all know from the Vivaldi Four Seasons. So, what do you see? What do you see? How is the instrument be playing? What's going on in the orchestra? All right, Paul, we can start number one. Right. What did you notice about, first of all, where was the conductor? Where was the conductor? Did anybody see a conductor? Oh, Una, right. Una, where was the conductor? Was the violinist in the front the conductor by any chance? He would be the leader. He was the leader. Yes, he took the role of a conductor, but there wasn't anybody specifically conducting, just doing this, waving their flabby arms. There wasn't anybody just doing that, okay? It was the player who would have been the leader, the string leader, with the concert master or the soloist. What else did somebody notice about the instruments? What did you notice in there with instruments? Uh, Quinn, what did you notice? Um, they were different because since they're more Baroque, one, I think I counted six strings and how you held the bow was different. Yes, how you held the bow. The instrument was actually different. Um, did anybody notice that big, the lute that was up there? Yeah, but you notice they combined the modern cello, what we consider the modern cello, it was, um, and the, the vials in there as well as the lute. So again, there's no clear cutoff of that. All right, tell me about the size of the orchestra. Give me a thumbs up in the reaction if it's the same size as you go here at the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra today. Thumbs up if that, the number of people on the stage would be the same. It would be so much smaller, absolutely back then, okay? And no conductor. Hey, Paul, let's go to number two, another piece by Vivaldi, okay? I want you to listen on this one. I want you to listen for how many times a similar idea keeps coming across. 
Vivaldi is great for taking one idea and repeating it and repeating it and repeating it. It's a very, very short idea, but it keeps getting repeated. What do you hear on this one, okay? What do you see maybe, but what do you hear different? How many patterns do you hear repeating themselves? Let's see how many patterns we can hear on this one. Thank you, Paul. Hey, where are their chairs? Where are those musicians' chairs? That wasn't used until the classical period. Baroque, because this was all new, they would stand. How many of you have your teachers ask you to stand when you practice at home? It also promotes better posture and better playing. Um, did anybody notice at the end of the piece, did the tempo stay the same or did it kind of fluctuate a little bit? Did it change? Yeah, she took a little bit of time with that solo. 
we could even call that a little bit of ornamentation, you know, kind of exploring, doing something a little bit differently than what was written. Okay, those were two pieces written by Vivaldi, okay? Vivaldi was probably the best we example. We have a composer who developed an idea, the concerto. Raise your hand if you know what a concerto is or if you've played a concerto. Okay, a concerto is written for a solo instrument and there's an orchestra accompanying you in the background. Okay, or an ensemble, I should say, maybe not always an orchestra, but that's where the idea started from. So you just heard two concertos, one for violin and one for recorder. Is the recorder a modern day instrument or is that one that was primarily used in the Baroque? Raise your hand if you think it was the Baroque period instrument. Yeah, we don't, there's not a recorder section in the Minnesota Orchestra, is there? Do they have the flutes, the oboes, the clarinets, the recorders, saxophones? No recorders. All right. Paul, we're going to go to our third listing example. This one was written between 1703, we think, and 1720. It took them. It took Bach. We're going to go, we're going to move to Germany right now. We're moving to our second uh, kind of musical center. We've, we're moving from Italy to Germany. We're going to listen to two recordings of Bach. And Paul, I would like you to play them kind of back to back, okay? One of them is played by somebody who is playing how it would have been played back then. And this, there, you won't be able to watch him. It's just a recording. And the second one, you'll be able to see and listen. And I want you to notice differences between what you hear and then what you hear in the second one, okay? This is from the first cello suite, which I have a sneaking suspicion you have heard this before. This again was, was this composed by Vivaldi or by Bach? Bach, Bach, Bach. Okay, thank you. Recording number one. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Paul. All right. Uh, uh, give me a thumbs up in the reaction if you've heard either those Bach cello suites or the, the, the performer Yo-Yo Ma. The first recording was performed by a cellist from the Netherlands. His name is Jaap Terlinden, and he's actually performed in the Twin Cities for many, many years and many times, and he's Yap has to be about 75 and he has more energy than even I have. It's, it's amazing. And I think I have a lot of energy and he'll come bounding on stage and play so beautifully. Um, so what were some of the differences that you heard with those recordings? Jenny, what Jenny Ram, what did you hear? Can you unmute yourself? Thank you. Um, one of the differences was the first one stayed a bit more steady, but the second one got louder and quieter and faster and slower a lot more. Okay, so there was a bigger range, perhaps. Different, different styles of interpretation. Um, Annalise, what about you? The, the first cellist probably played on gut core or all gut strings. The second cellist played on strings that were steel core in the C string. It sounded like it had just been replaced. <laughs> Very observant. And that's one thing we're going to, I'll mention right now in terms of strings. Oh my goodness. Did you notice that the hall that Yo-Yo Ma was playing in, that was Royal Albert Hall where the proms are. I, I think that's the hall that it's in. Um, seating thousands of people. That would have never been in the Baroque period. They played for intimate audiences, maybe court. They started chamber music. That's where the word comes from, playing for chamber audiences. And then they grew and expanded, but never in a hall that big. So Baroque period strings would be made out of gut. You're all supposed to go, ooh. So let me tell you a little bit about gut strings. They're made out of sheep gut. Now everybody go, ooh, okay. Now, if you've ever heard that violin strings were made out of cat gut, has anybody ever heard that horrible thing? It's not true. It's literally something that was lost in translation. A kit is a kind of a nickname for a fiddle, a kit, and it somehow got lost, kit gut, violin gut, cat gut. But it's still made from sheep, the innards, you know, when um, uh, you have an animal and you use all the parts, they figured out that stretching strings, gut strings could be used, the gut could be used to make a string. Um, it's a softer sound, but they didn't need a big sound back then. They didn't need a, a hall the size that Yo-Yo Ma played in. And that changed um, over time. Again, the lines are, it's an, a gradual evolution, okay? And it was about World War I, I believe, when steel strings pretty much started replacing everything. Um, so could we go to recording number five? And this is the Bach. We're gonna listen to one more of Bach. We've listened to two of Vivaldi. We listened to a cello suite. And again, something for solo instrument. This is new up to this time. In the Renaissance, would you play a music just, would you play a piece just for your instrument? No. So that was a lovely thing that Bach wrote and gave to us, you know, all these hundreds of years later. Raise your hand or give me a reaction if you've heard of the Bach Brandenburg concertos. All right, he wrote six of them and he did not write them all together and bundle them up. Who knows what a Margrave is? Anybody know what a Margrave is? It's pretty much similar to a prince, somebody who um, inherited their title to royalty. Well, Bach was really desperate for a job. Most musicians are. Bach was really desperate for a job, so he had written these pieces and he bundled them all together and he gave them to the prince hoping he could get a job. We don't know what happened as a result of that, but what we do know is that these are probably some of the most famous and most amazing orchestral pieces that we have of Bach. And they're for all sorts of instruments. And you know what? I chose the one that doesn't have any violins. I chose number six, which features the violas. So Paul, let's go actually as long as we can on this one, okay? 
Thank you so much. So this is Bach Brandenburg number six. Hey, tell me what you see on this recording. You've seen recordings of people playing historically informed, meaning how it would have been. We don't have these recordings from back 300 years ago. We only have the treatises and the writings that we can fall back on and research. So please watch, okay? Write down three things that you see on your little uh, piece of paper. Why don't you write down three things that you see or hear with this Bach Brandenburg? It's such a lovely piece. Violas and lower strings and harpsichord.
Thank you, Paul. Hey, where was their conductor? Where were their chairs? And why were their stands down so low? Anybody know why their stands were down so low? Quinn. I think the reason they put their stands so low is so you can have eye contact with everyone else. Exactly. We tend to do this when we play barrier so nobody will see us and we can't see others and that's how they communicated. All right. Hey, what year was the Baroque period? Hmm, when did it start? 1500 or 1600? Raise your hand if it was 1500. Raise your hand if it was 1600. Raise your hand if some of these time periods, these musical periods overlapped. Raise your hand if it overlapped. Exactly. Okay. Um, did you notice anything else uh, besides, did you notice some of the other instruments that were in there? I want you to think about if there's any common threads with what you've been seeing. All right. At the very beginning, I said Baroque music started to come on its own to create music for certain instruments. Prior to that, it was used just for dance or to accompany a singer. Well, we're going to see... A, we're going to listen to and see a piece by Rameau, our French composer, remember, who followed in the heels of Lully. We're going to see how dancers in the courts, they have to have not only new music, but new dances every week. There was a court musician, a court dance master. They valued these arts so greatly back in the Baroque period. So, Paul, if you could play the Rameau you're going to hear a tambourine, which is a pretty lively dance. What do you see in this one? Write three things down. There's a conductor on stage. There's a conductor on stage. He's there to keep the chorus together. All right, I'm gonna go out on a limb here, okay? That would have been dance and music of the day and they had special costumes, special instruments. Maybe that would be similar, this is my going out on a limb here, to Beyonce and Jay-Z. If Beyonce were to have special costumes and special music, it'd be kind of like we do that Nowadays, we have new music being churned out all the time. Absolutely. Well, we're going to end with music that was written for a special occasion. Okay. Uh, King George had asked Handel to write a piece called the water music. We're going to England. Remember, Handel shared an apartment or lived next door 300 years earlier to what guitarist in the 60s? Jimmy. Way to go, Roman. Hendrix, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, 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 exactly. 
Okay, the king loved this music so much, if you can imagine this, he asked the musicians to play it over and over and over again, four times, four hours of music. He loved it that much. I think that's why we have unions nowadays. I'm not sure. Um, but I want you to listen to the water music, okay? Are you hearing any similarities with beats, with rhythms, with themes? Paul, why don't we just play about a minute or so of this? Would be great. Thank you. <laughs> You know what? That was also a dance. The, the water music is a dance moment suite. So we've talked about how the time periods, there isn't a specific cutoff. Dances were used before the Baroque, in the Baroque, and even after the Baroque period. All right. Raise your hand if Rameau was a musician from Italy. Raise your hand if Scarlatti was a Baroque composer from France. Raise your hand if Bach was a modern composer from Germany. Raise your hand if Bach had four sons who became composers. Four composers. Why did Bach never go listen to the music of Telemann in a concert? Because he was Baroque. Oh, that's the bad musical joke of the day. Oh, that was so, so bad. I apologize that we're ending on that. All right. So we have about 30 seconds left. I hope you've learned something about musical time periods. I hope you've learned something about how our music connected with our architecture and our literature. I hope you learned something about a composer that was with a certain region. Remember the, you know, boundaries of these places changed just like the timelines changed as well. And the orchestras changed as well too. You know, we started with a standing formation and now we've got pretty much our standard orchestral seating and how these instruments evolved. Tuning changed depending on where you were and historically informed performances. That's a hip musician. That's what we saw with all of these orchestras that were playing standing without a conductor, with a harpsichord. They were going back to how we think it would have been done based on the writings um, that we have and the diagrams, the pictures from back then. So if you want to be a hip Baroque musician, you need to watch and read what the composers have left us with. Um, they haven't left us with the videos, but many groups have. And I hope you um, will today listen to something. There's so many resources out there to listen to the music of these great composers. I hope you would maybe um, find something to listen to, read about these great composers, because unlike our iPhones, this will be around for another 400 years. I want to thank you for being such an attentive um, class. I don't know, this is a class, a session, a gathering, our gathering time. So thank you so much. I'll send you, you'll get um, tomorrow, you'll get a little recap of what we did. And I would encourage you to listen and to play. Find your favorite Baroque composer and play it on your instrument. Play it on a different instrument. Try something new. So thank you so much. Have a great rest of your week and um, carry on. Play your instruments. Bye-bye.